Thank you for joining the Detroit Buy, Hold, Invest podcast. My name is David Rabior, Clyde Realty, Detroit's best investment agent, maybe even on the planet. Who knows? That's not for me to decide. Let's get right into it and talk a little bit today about Detroit, Metro Detroit, Section 8, how it works. Is it for you? Is it not for you? All of those good things. So people come to me all the time and they ask me, Dave, if I'm going to be a landlord, what should I do? Should I rent to a cash paying tenant? Should I rent to a Section 8 tenant? I'm not sure what's good, what's bad. Some people come to me and say, hey, I've already predetermined that I want to rent to a Section 8 tenant. Can you help me do that? And my answer to that is yes. Do I know what to tell you? Absolutely. Do I have the, uh, do I have the experience to give you the proper advice when it comes to that? 100,000%. Am I a landlord myself? Yes. Do I love being a landlord? I actually like it. Not love, but I like it. And I think that it's a really good thing for all people, especially, and we've talked about this on prior podcasts, the benefits of being a landlord, why it's good, why long-term holding of real estate is better than flipping or trying to do some short-term strategy. And you know the benefits really do uh, they really do lie in being a buy and hold investor. And it comes down to, you know, what kind of tenant that you want to place, what kind of property that you provide to them, how good it is, how bad it is, you know, what your expectations are as a landlord, your understanding of what, um, it's like to be a landlord in, in that class of a property, which some would say is a D class, uh, investment, even if the houses are, you know, a hundred thousand, 125,000, some people would say, Trying to be a landlord um, and renting the Section 8 tenants is going to be, you know, a D-class investment. But today we're going to talk all about, you know, Section 8, how it works. Is it worth it? Is it something that you should take on as a landlord? Um, do the benefits outweigh the risks and all of those good things? And I believe that I'm 100% able to qualify uh, all of those questions and answer them and give you the adequate advice that you need because I have been a landlord for a long time and I've sold thousands almost, I would say I'm close to 2000 properties sold, um, or really getting close. I haven't counted, but you know, last year we sold hundreds and the year before we sold hundreds. So it's getting, it's getting to the point where I feel like, you know, after selling hundreds and hundreds of occupied and vacant properties for the purpose of renting, I can give you qualified advice based on my experiences, both as a landlord personally and as an agent that represents people that buy nothing but rentals. So today we're going to talk about Section 8. What is Section 8? Section 8 is a government funded program where someone who is of a certain means can qualify for assistance. Uh, and in some cases get all of their rent, and in most cases they can get a very good portion of their rent paid uh, from the agency on their behalf in order for them to have a place to live. And that money that they get is extremely good and it's higher than the market value for a cash paying tenant or what they're willing to pay right now. So most landlords wanna go for the security of getting guaranteed payments and they also want to go for the security of knowing that Section 8 tenants stay longer on average uh, than a cash paying tenant does. And um, they also want to know that, you know, the rent that they will receive from the tenant is extremely much, much higher than you're going to get from a cash paying tenant. In almost every case, and I know that because I sell rental properties literally every single day and I help people get them rented by providing them with property managers and different referrals, uh, solo agents that do, you know, marketing for that um, to rent property. So based on my experiences, I can tell you almost every single time Section 8 in Detroit particularly will pay more than a cash paying tenant. And you will receive a good tenant if you understand how they work, you understand how the program works, you understand what your expectations should be in regard to being a Section 8 landlord, and you understand the type of property that you need to provide and deliver to the tenant and how to manage it long term. So let's talk a little bit about Section 8, what it is and how it works. So somebody goes to a Section 8 agency and they apply to become a Section 8 tenant. When they do that, they have to provide certain information about themselves that tells you and tells the agency why that they believe that they should be qualified for Section 8. And if they can do that and do that properly, and everything is legitimate, they eventually will get um, rewarded or, you know, approved for uh, assistance with their rent, you know, and this could be 
a single mom with one kid or five kids or a hundred kids. It could be an older uh, woman who needs assistance, period. Maybe she takes care of her grandkids. Maybe she doesn't. I mean, recently, you know, I placed a single dad with, uh, I think he had three kids um, and the mother was not in the picture and he received Section 8. And I've also placed a woman recently who was in her 40s and had no kids and she was on Section 8 and received a full voucher for a two-bedroom house. So why they why they qualify how they qualify that's not really my business my business is if we have a property that is up for rent whether it be my own or one of my clients should we take a section 8 tenant and how will we qualify them to make sure that we don't end up with some nightmare tenant from hell that you know creates all these problems and and, and this and that and the other thing so um today is sunday last week was a very long week so bear with me i'm not not filled with joy and excitement like I normally would be, and I'm not live on the mic like I usually am. So I want to talk, though, about Section 8 because I just keep getting asked these questions from new people all the time, and I get keep, you know, I keep getting asked questions from people who I currently represent. Is Section 8 good? Should I still keep doing Section 8? Should I start doing Section 8? You know, why should I do it? And, you know, the process is really this. Somebody goes to the agency, they qualify based on, you know, their financial background, and eventually they get issued a voucher for a certain amount of bedrooms, one, two, three, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, whatever it is. And that's determined by how many kids they have or, or what their qualifications are. And there's a lot of different ways that they qualify these tenants. But usually it's a single man or woman or it's a, a you know, of some nature and, Usually they have children involved. That's the majority of what you're going to see with Section 8. There are other cases, but let's just talk about the norm, right? So single mom or a single dad, they go there, they get qualified. And when they get qualified, um, you know, they fill out everything and then they go on a waiting list. And that waiting list is, you know, four years long. It's taken forever for them to get the voucher. And once they do get the voucher, they get issued what they call a landlord packet. And that landlord packet has this packet that you fill out when you determine that you want to rent to them. And then in that packet, it talks about, you know, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, is there a basement, is there a garage? What kind of amenities are you providing? Are you giving them a fridge, a stove, laundry, washer, dryer? Are you providing them with uh, central air conditioning, gas furnace? Is it a radiator? You know, all that stuff is in there. And you need to know all that stuff. And you need to make sure that your house is prepared uh, to be marketed because when those people get that voucher, they only have a short period of time in order to fill that voucher. And if they don't fill the voucher, they lose it. So as soon as they get that call and they know that they're going to get that landlord packet, they're going to come hot like fire, like a missile shooting over on everything they see in the areas that they have interested in, you know, interest in, whether it be, you know, Zillow or affordablehousing.com, which is where, you know, most landlords list Section 8 properties, affordablehousing.com. And that's where most tenants go looking first. And based on the amount of money that they get for their voucher um, and the amount of bedrooms, they're going to find you and your property, and it's going to hopefully be marketed properly with good photos, and the property is going to be fixed up uh, and ready because you're going to have to go through an inspection um, for MISHTA, which is Section 8, State of Michigan, uh, and you're going to have to meet certain requirements in order for you to be able to qualify to receive this rent uh, and have this person. And you're going to have to do that first before they move in, and then you're going to have to do it every year following. And sometimes if you're a good landlord and you pass the inspection easily, they'll give it to you every couple of years. I've seen that happen. And you know, hopefully one day that'll become the norm because the Detroit rental inspection CFC, which is a certificate of compliance, that's good for three years. So the process is they get their, they get their voucher, they get their move packet, they go online, they come in like a rocket ship calling, they're blowing your phone up. They want to, you know, they have interest in the house. They want to know if you'll rent to a section eight tenant. They want to see it. They want this and they want that and the other thing, but you still have to do your due diligence and you can't just open the house up for anybody. So when they, <clears throat> because you'll be doing that all day, you know, you might show that house 30 times in a week and not find one person that qualifies. So once they get that voucher and they decide that they want to find something, they're going to come to you and they're going to ask if, if you'll rent them, they're going to ask you, you know, how many, how many real bedrooms are, what are you going to provide, you know, how much money they have to put down for security deposit and all these different questions they're going to want to know because they're on a fixed income. So they have to come up with the money for their own security deposit. Section 8 doesn't pay that for them. They have to pay that on their own. So a lot of factors go into whether once they get the voucher, if they can actually really move too, because they have to do some things and nobody's going to do everything for them. So 
they have to qualify based on that. So once they do, they're going to call. You get them on the phone. The biggest thing is, you know, if you're the landlord and you're doing it yourself or you have a property manager, what we're doing here, this is the objective, have a preliminary qu- list of questions that you're going to ask them to kind of pre-qualify them before you waste your time opening the door for them. And I say that not just for Section 8, but for any tenant, um, you know, if they don't even know what their credit score is and, and they're out in the market shopping for a rental, you know, that's a red flag, right? If they don't have any pay stubs, they have no financial information they can provide, that's a red flag. And we talked about that. We've talked about that. And we'll continue to talk about that and how to vet a tenant properly. But Section 8 tenants should be qualified the same as a cash paying tenant, you know, just because they get a $1,400 or a $1,300 voucher, that's just for rent. And they do have to pay a portion of that in most cases. It's very rare that they're going to get 100% of it paid. And if they do, they're constantly getting reevaluated. And that can be, you know, they could be getting full share with all their rent paid. And six months later, they could be paying three, four hundred bucks. And a year from then, or two years down the road, they could get a better job or start improving in their life. And they could be paying half the rent. And the goal is not to keep them on Section 8 forever. The goal is for them to improve in their life, pay more and more of their bills, with Section 8 being only a supplement of that. Then eventually getting off that program and becoming, you know, a regular person that pays their bills as a job that takes care of their family, because that's a goal for everybody. And the ones that are like trying to cling on to the program and get it for free forever and not do anything, they're not going to, it's not going to happen. Like they're going to lose that voucher eventually and they're going to be on their butt. So when they come, you give them this preliminary list of questions. And, you know, you figure out based on that, we can get together personally for a one on one if you want to talk more about like how to successfully qualify a Section 8 tenant. I'm not going to go into all that today because this episode will go on for two hours. But you qualify them. The goal is for you to figure out if they're more likely to have qualified to be a renter for you, a tenant, and then you go out and somebody opens the door. They go through there and they determine they like it and they want to live there. And it all lines up for them. And you got to be 100% transparent with them about how much you expect them to pay to move in and if they can have pets or not, because if you don't establish that right away, it's going to become a problem later. And you can't have unrealistic expectations about what that person can really afford either, because some of them are having a hard time coming up with just a thousand bucks to move in. That doesn't mean that they're going to be a bad tenant, right? They're on a fixed income. They're on assistance. So how much money do you think they really have? They're not gonna be able to put down $2,400 to move in unless it's like tax time in most cases, not to say it never happens, but most of the time, that's the deal. So once you qualify them and you you know, you know take them around, they like it, they're going to show up with a landlord packet. And it's going to be a package that you have to fill out where you give all this information to the caseworker about all the amenities that you'll provide, how much rent you want, what kind of house it is, you know, does it have a garage, a basement, central air, does it have you know this, does it have that. You're going to fill all that out, send it over to the caseworker, and then the caseworker is going to come back and say, okay, based on the house, the area, the amount of rent you want, and the amenities you provide, we are willing to pay you that or we're, we're not, um, and they'll give you a counter offer almost every time, and usually they don't counter, but when they do, it's pretty close, but the tenant is only approved for so much. You know, they have a voucher for, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars and it's for a two bedroom, it's for a three bedroom. Sometimes you can get them to get, you know, if they have a two bedroom voucher, you can get them bumped to a three, depending on the necessity there and the and the, the caseworker's ability to like wanna work with you or whatever. But most of the time they know how much money in rent they're gonna receive and they know uh, how many bedrooms that they can qualify for based on how many people live in their home and they come to you you qualify them, you show them the house, they fill out the packet, you send it back to the caseworker, and then they come back and they try to figure out, um, you know, based on what you said, can they actually pay that? And does the tenant actually qualify for what you're offering? And if the answer is yes, then they schedule the Section 8 HUD MISHTA inspection. And when they come out for that inspection, the inspector is going to be looking for health and safety stuff that you must qualify for if you want to place that tenant, you have to pass it. That inspection is going to occur before they move in. And then you're going to have to do it annually. And if you're a really good landlord and you have a long-term relationship with that agency, sometimes they'll push it to every two years and do you a favor. But most of the time you have to plan, you have to do the inspection before they move in. And then you have to do an annual reinspection. The first inspection that you do when they move in 
is difficult to pass, but if your house is in good order and you can pass the CFC inspection, then you will pass the Section 8 inspection, and you can then use that Section 8 inspection to uh, count as your rental inspection for the purpose of getting your certificate of compliance in Detroit, which is very helpful. This inspection is free, and it used to be free to use it to... Um, you know, use as a part of your rental inspection for the CFC, but now they're charging $77 to you as a landlord to be able to file that to use it, which is a whole money grab thing. And that's a whole different conversation for another day. But you found the tenant, you fill out the paperwork, you've now scheduled your Section 8 inspection. They come out, they're looking for smoke detectors, carbon dioxide detectors. They want to see that all the doors open and shut and lock is designed. They want to see all the windows open, shut, and lock is designed. They want to make sure there's no exterior or interior safety hazards and that the heat works and that the water works and the hot water works and the water pressure is good. They want to make sure that there's no peeling and chipping paint, no loose stairs, no loose handrails, you know, stuff like that. So the person can move right in. And the goal is the inspector needs to be able to walk in do the inspection and walk out and that house needs to be ready for that tenant to move in. When they say you pass, that means the tenant's ready to move in. Like right there on the spot, if you wanted to let that happen, you could, but that's not how it usually works. If they come out, they give you a pass or they give you a fail. If they give you a fail, they give you a list of requirements that you need to repair, then they'll come back, do one more inspection, and then you're usually good to go. And if you pass on the first try, which a lot of people do, um, then the you know they turn that in within a day or two they come back from the case office and they say hey congratulations you can meet the tenant now sign the lease and collect the security deposit and then turn all that over to us when you have it and then once you do that and the tenant you know gives you the security deposit and signs everything and they move in then very shortly thereafter they're going to contact you and you know a, a part of your landlord package also was your um your form that you give them for how you want to receive payment. Most people like to get that direct deposit. So you've already provided them all that. So once you, the tenant moves in, normally it takes about 45 to 60 days to receive your first disbursement from section eight. Once you do, you get all the back rent plus the current month, and then you're good to go in between the first and the fifth, every single month, as long as you qualify for the program and you're not on abatement or anything like that, you're going to get money like clockwork every single month. And it's going to be a lot, you know, single family homes are renting for, you know, 1300 to 1380. Um, two bedroom homes are like 1200 bucks and you get a four bedroom. I mean, you can get up to $1,600 pretty easily. And I've seen it happen many, many times. So once you're receiving all of this, the tenant is living there and it's very important for you to set the criteria about what you expect as a landlord before they move in. Like if you don't want them to have pets, you need to let that be known before you sign the lease. I would recommend, you know, you sign a lease for a year increment with a Section 8 tenant. A lot of people let them go month to month after the first year. I don't like signing people to two-year leases, but they will get a one-year lease when I first place them. And after that, I'm going to keep them on month to month as long as I can and and still ask for, you know, increases in the rent and stuff. And if they require me to get a new lease, I will sign a new lease in order to get a significant rent increase after the first year or two. You know, so now the person's living in your house and now you're on autopilot with the payment and you know who the caseworker is. And now it's your job. You can't assume now that because you're getting rent every single month without any problem, that can change. When you put that tenant in, you know, they might get full rent. They might get a full $1,300 paid. They still have to pay utilities. They still have to pay other things, right? And they still have to pay to afford to live, buy food, pay for a car, you know, car insurance, cell phone bill, internet, all that stuff. They have to pay all that stuff and they have to pay their security deposit out of their own pocket too. So when they move in, you got to make sure when you place them that you do your due diligence. How are, how are they making income aside from the program for section eight? And if that all lines up and you put them in there, you still got to make sure that you periodically are checking on the house. And what I like to do is every three months we do a quarterly maintenance walkthrough. And when we do that walkthrough, two times out of the year, we do like furnace filter swaps. And then two times of the year when we do it, we do like smoke detector battery checks. And even though most smoke detectors, you can buy them with these long life batteries or whatever, we still do it because we want to go into the house every three months and see who's living there, how many bodies are in the house. Is there anybody that's living in the house that's not on the lease? And then we deal with that as, you know, accordingly, and we'll get to that in another show. But you have to make sure that you're going and having these maintenance walkthroughs at least twice a year. 
if it's only to check the smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, and and uh, the furnace filters, you're at least getting an idea of who's living in your house and in what condition that they live. And you have to understand that people that live in D-class environments may or may not line up with the way that you think that people should live. That doesn't mean it's wrong, right? Uh, you just may not be familiar or comfortable with that, and you have to be familiar with with that whole thing before you get involved, or you have to figure out how to get used to it, or you need to be mentored on you know, what to expect so that you don't get um, a walkthrough on one of your properties and find, you know, two two kids and their their parent living in a home and they have just their bedrooms and nothing else, no furniture, no kitchen table, no nothing, because you'll see that. You'll see that quite a bit, to be honest, or you'll see people that live um, messy or whatever, and you may be a clean freak and that might not line up with you. That doesn't mean it's wrong. That just means that you don't like that. And if you don't, you have the right to terminate that you know, relationship after the lease term expires and find a new tenant that more fits your needs. But if you're going through there quarterly or every six months, you have that, you have the opportunity then to see how they're living and then try to make corrections to that or inform them that you may or may not be okay with the way that they're occupying your property, which is legal to do. I mean, you don't want to be insulting people, but you can say, you know, you, you require that whoever lives in your home, uh, holds it to a certain standard. And if they don't, like you have the right to just not continue to rent them after the first year or however long the first term of your lease is. So I tell everybody, if you want to get involved in the Section 8 program, there's a lot of moving parts to that. This is just a basic synopsis, synopsis, however you want to say that, of how it's done and what to expect. Now, once you go through the CFC process and you have your Section 8 and all that stuff, you're good for three years, but you still have an annual inspection from Section 8, and you still are going to have to um, let them in. Now, the secondary inspections, like as the years go by, are pretty easy. Like They're not going to beat you up like when they first do it, when you first put the tenant in. The annual, you know, reinspections are pretty easy, and and most of the time you're going to see like the tenant took the smoke detectors down, which I don't know why they do that. Um, you know, we try to place them in areas where they don't really go off. So if they have a battery go dead or low and it starts beeping, like all they have to do is call. They don't. They just take them down for whatever reason, and you know, you have to constantly keep putting those up and smoke detectors and carbon dioxide detectors. Uh, <clears throat> those are always something and then leaks under sinks people have a tendency of putting a whole bunch of stuff and packing under a sink to where it makes the trap get loose and it leaks under there and all that stuff but there's all these things you need to know when you're a section 8 landlord and the most important thing is like what it is how it works is it for you how much money do they pay and how hard is it to do and i'll tell you it's a great program. It's government funded. Uh, the rent comes like clockwork if you do it right. If you have houses that you want to make nice for tenants, like it's very easy to pass the inspections if you do things right. And once you understand what they're looking for, you can easily pass them. And it doesn't mean that every single thing in your property has to be perfect either. I mean, that's not what they're looking for. They're just looking for basic criteria to make sure that the house is safe uh, for the person that lives there. And they require you to keep it to that standard. That's They're not asking you to put in golden toilets and paint murals on the ceiling here, folks. So hopefully that's helpful. I'm going to do a shorter podcast this week. I uh, had so much to do. I may have to go to every other week on these podcasts uh, as we get into the summertime because I got a lot of stuff going on with uh, real estate and with my fishing stuff I'm doing in this YouTube channel that I have for the fishing. And I have all these great things going on. So I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks for joining the Detroit Buy, Hold, Invest podcast, www.DetroitBuyHoldInvest.com. David Rabior, Clyde Realty, Detroit's best investment agent. At least that's what they say. Have a good day, and hopefully this is helpful. And all we're going to do is continue to learn Detroit Buy, Hold, Invest. We